American tech. Better tech. Alrighty, we're going to uh, give everybody a couple seconds to get connected here before we uh, fire up the show, guys. Oh, boy. You know, it's tough now because the stuff that I would normally, like, try to cram into an hour of Aftershock, I have to, uh, I have to hang on to that now because... You know, I got four hours of radio to fill tomorrow, so I don't want to burn my content now, you know. But then there's so much. Like, I had a whole show planned. Um, literally, I had planned down to the segment. This is what we're going to talk about here and there, and this is when we're going to ask for calls. I mean, there's, it was a show plan, right? And, you know, con- I haven't even made contact with the enemy yet. You're not the enemy. That's not what I'm saying. But you get the, you know, I haven't even, we haven't even gotten on the air yet. And then yesterday, I opened up my, my news, and I'm like... They're going to arrest Trump on Monday, Tuesday, potentially, whatever, next week. While I'm on the air, they're going to arrest Trump. Wow, that's uh, that's something. Okay, going to have to look into that a little bit, right? Um, wow, while I'm on the air, the Federal Reserve is going to decide if it should raise rates in the middle of a banking crisis. Going to have to talk about that a little bit, right? Crazy. Hmm. Wow, First Republic will probably fail while I'm on the air at some point. First Republic Bank. Shoot. Oh, hey, UBS is trying to buy out Credit Suisse, and we'll know by the end of the day today, our time, whether or not uh, the Swiss government gave UBS the $6 billion backstop guarantee that it requires in order to purchase Credit Suisse. And if they don't, Credit Suisse will probably fail while I'm on the air. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the world saved all of the really, really, really interesting and bad news for my show. So there you go. Uh, So I got to be careful. I don't want to burn. I don't want to, you know, shoot my whole wad here in the aftershock and then have people watch this and be like, okay, I don't got to listen to that that stupid show for four hours on KFAB now. But uh, we got some fun stuff planned. So um, we... And I'll talk about this a little bit on uh, on the show tomorrow when I when I do my intro monologue segment or whatever whole you know fifteen minutes of me telling you why I'm there. Uh, but I'm going to introduce myself and then I'm going to basically explain kind of why I am there. And this was a big deal to me because you know first of all it was a huge honor being asked to cover for two weeks. And it, right now it's just a cover. I'm, I'm there for two weeks. I'm your Huckleberry for two weeks. Don't inv- don't get too invested because, you know, I'll be gone in two weeks. So this is more of like a spring break fling, okay? Um, I might actually use that. That's good. Um, so anyway, the, the long and the short of it is I don't have a burning desire to bring you the breaking news of the day. This is the news. I'm not a newscaster. I'm not an anchor. Um, I don't am not entirely confident in my ability to be funny. I am not a comedian. I can be humorous at times, but usually it's people laughing at me rather than with me, okay? So, you know, okay, there's that. So we'll we'll have fun, but it's not going to be a comedy, like, (laughs) you know, it's not going to be a comedy show. Okay. No one's getting slapped, all right? Um... Okay, I like to learn things, right? But Glenn Beck kind of did the whole, let's get the chalkboard, Bueller, you know. That's great for a while, but then after a while, you run out of, you run out of interesting things to learn about that, that seem to be impactful on your life, and you're like, why am I listening anymore? At least that's what happened to me. Um, or you listen to Sean Hannity, and you realize after like a year of listening to Sean Hannity that it doesn't matter what the news story of the day is, it's the exact same show. Every show. It's the same. The 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 insert four negative adjectives about Democrats or liberals here, you know, the lazy, arrogant, duplicitous, you know, rude liberals, you know, okay, got it. You know, you're preaching to the choir here, Hannity. Okay. Everybody, everybody knows where you stand. That's why they're watching, you know, or that's why they're listening. Um, Great example of this. This is something that's going to tie. This is what's going to happen. This is what will happen this next week if Trump is arrested. Do you remember the Supreme Court nomination process when Trump was, uh, uh, basically Obama was a lame duck and a Supreme Court opening happened and the Senate, controlled by Republicans, said, you know, the incoming president should decide who the next Supreme Court justice is, not some lame duck, you know, Obama guy. 
And so the Senate refused to hear Merrick Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court because politics. But no one was willing to call it politics. They, you know, especially Hannity, made up all these elaborate arguments about, you know, why this is the way it should be and why this is how it is. So then Trump gets into office and the roles are reversed. And now he's got a nominee and the and basically the 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 Democrats are going to filibuster the nominee. They're going to they're in the minority, but they're going to stop it. And so the Republicans change the rules of the Senate in order to break the filibuster only on judicial nominees and then move it forward. Why? And then Hannity will get on and make the exact opposite argument. He'll say the exact opposite thing. And you're just like, but you just, how are you arguing that you are the person of rationality and you are a person of facts that matter, but you're willing to take two situations that are virtually identical and you just happen to fall on the side where it's convenient. So let's rewind the tape all the way back to the 90s. Do you remember Bill Clinton? Do you remember the Democrats defending Bill Clinton? This is a prosecution, this is a political prosecution about a private sexual encounter that was consensual, that this is about sex. This is not about his ability to lead the country. This is not about anything like that. Now, fast forward all the way to today, and what are Democrats saying? President Trump paid off Stormy Daniels, and now he's going to go to jail for it. He's a felon, you know. And you're going to have Hannity out there arguing that this is all a political witch hunt, which you can make an argument for that, but, you know, he's going to argue. Basically, in, when Clinton was around, he argued that character mattered and that your character determines the kind of president you're going to be. And now that Trump is in office, if you're assuming, because Trump still denies it, he denies that any of this happened with Stormy Daniels, but... Okay, um, so he denies it, but let's just assume for the sake of discussion that it happened. Hannity's going to argue the exact opposite now, that it doesn't matter, that it that does not reflect on his ability to lead. Just look at the record. Look at what this man did for our country. This is just a political prosecution. So what is happening with Trump? Why is this happening? Okay, so it is alleged. See, this is, uh, this is the news thing. I have to learn how to do the newsy thing. And, like, I can't just say things because KFAB, the, the bar is a lot higher than just, you know, the aftershock. So it is alleged that former President Trump had a sexual relationship with a porn star named Stormy Daniels um, before he became president. During the election in 2016, it's alleged that he was concerned that this uh, affair would become public and would damage his, his likelihood of being elected. So it is alleged that Stormy Daniels was paid $130,000 to keep quiet about it, which she, of course, did not. Um, there you go. Stormy Daniels. So where's the crime here? What happens is that assuming all the allegations are accurate, if the alleged interaction did happen and there was a payment that was made, the payment was made to Michael Cohen, Trump's attorney, his personal attorney, or not personal, his business attorney. And Trump is saying, I paid Michael Cohen for legal advice on how to handle a situation with someone who was trying to extort money from me. He gave me his professional advice and I paid him $130,000 for his professional advice. Now, unbeknownst to me, President Trump, Unbeknownst to me, the way that my attorney chose to handle the situation was my attorney of his own volition went to Stormy Daniels and happened to pay her the exact same amount of money that I paid him for legal advice. Donald Trump never gave Stormy Daniels a dime. That's fact, actually. Um, there is no check like to Stormy from Donald Trump. Donald J. Trump, you know, he didn't want to sign that stimmy check. Uh, so money went to Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen pays Stormy. Stormy doesn't keep quiet. And now the whole world's blown up. So he wrote it off as a business expense, as a legal expense. I paid my attorney for legal advice. So what they're saying is 
that this was actually a falsification of business records, which is a misdemeanor in the state of New York. Okay? So, objective one, bar number one, and there's a grand jury right now who is in panel trying to figure out if this should get prosecuted. It, can you prove that Donald Trump knowingly falsified business records in order to pay off the porn star he had an affair with? There's a lot of alleged in there, right? So you got to prove that first. The second thing is it's just a misdemeanor. It doesn't, it's, it, misdemeanors happen all the time. You know, I've been charged with a misdemeanor before. Um, it was not fair, by the way. It was fake news. But I was charged with a misdemeanor, and it was dismissed. So misdemeanors happen all the time. What happens next, though, is New York law says if a misdemeanor is committed with the objective of covering up a second crime, that makes the misdemeanor a felony. What's the second crime? The second crime is violating New York State's campaign finance laws by not disclosing that this legal payment to Michael Cohen, which was actually allegedly a payment to Stormy Daniels, to, to help his election chances in 2016, should have been disclosed as a contribution to his campaign. That's So the, the, the really, really bad thing here is you lied about what you did for your campaign. Okay? Now I'm going to put on my Sean Hannity hat. Okay? Hillary Clinton lied about her campaign finance. She paid a record fee to the SEC or to uh, to the campaign finance people in New York, whatever organization that is. Like a hundred, you know, he paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, and she got off with a fine. She wasn't even charged with a misdemeanor, and she falsified records, arguably intentionally. She wiped the server with a cloth and everything. You know, it. She got a fee. She got a fine, and President Trump, who is. God's gift to sainthood, who would never do anything to harm the hair on the head of a puppy, unlike Dr. Fauci. Poor Donald Trump is being persecuted politically because the Democrats are terrified of him running in 2024. And they're going to stop him at any cost, at any cost, even if they have to make up a crime with a district attorney who has previously taken other felonies and downgraded them to misdemeanors for criminals locally, but not for Donald Trump, because Donald Trump, you got to get Donald Trump, because he's going to, he could win. We got to get him, you know? Okay, so there's Sean Hannity's take, right? Now you know, you don't have to listen to his show, you know what he's going to say. What time is he on in the afternoon? Oh, yeah, <laughs> the same time I am, just saying. Um, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, apologies to anyone who's a Sean Hannity fan, okay? I'm, it's not my intent to disparage somebody or make to elevate myself by disparaging somebody else. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be funny. See what I mean about being not funny all the time? So long story short, um, there's a lot of things that are going to have to get proven here, but it's not about proving a crime at this point. Right now it's about are we going to get a perp walk? Are we going to handcuff the former president? He's the first former president in the history of the United States to ever be charged with a crime, with a felony, after leaving office. So he'll have all kinds of dubious titles by his name. My first reaction to this whole thing was, number one, this is going to be rocket fuel for Trump's campaign. Because a small vocal minority of people are going to rally behind him on this. And by rally behind, I don't mean they're going to go, he was like, protest, protest, protest. You know, you're an idiot if you go to a protest, right? Look at what happened on January 6th. You don't go to a physical protest. You make your voice heard through the media, through social media, through your congressman, through your senator, through giving interviews or voting or whatever. But you know, don't go to an event and stand there with a sign and be like, rah, 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 you know, don't, don't do that. That's, that's going to be a bad, bad idea, okay? If he's arrested and charged... It is likely that it will take months. He's going to have to have a trial by a jury of his peers for a felony, right? They're going to put the orange man in the orange suit? You know, are they going to arrest him? Are they going to detain him while he waits for trial? Is he a flight risk because he's a billionaire and has properties around the world? Do you see all the things that are going to be talked about? Like, is he going to run away? Is he going to do this? Is he going to do that? <sighs> My second reaction to this story is, 
<laughs> you want to you want to break 200 years of presidential tradition right now? Like right now. Okay, so there's always been this gentleman's agreement, right? You don't go after the people who came before you, and no one will go after you when you're gone. Got it? Comprende? Good. I'm glad we all understand each other here. That's why Hillary doesn't get prosecuted. That's why Nixon never got prosecuted. People don't go after former presidents. You just don't do it. But now they're going to do it. We want the short-term gain. We're going to set the precedent. We're going to go after Trump. And in the meantime, we've got this guy over here who's got, like, literally, like, wire transfers coming in directly from, like, China, Inc., coming into his bank account. Uh, and his kids are splitting up the money and emailing each other about how much they need and who should get what. And then they have all of it. And they're like, right now, you want to set the precedent of going after a former president for felonies that happened before they were the president of the United States after they're gone. And you want to do that right now? To a president who's not exactly popular, Biden, with an economy that is not going to be probably in good shape by the time 2024 rolls around. So we're going to have a Carter-esque president in 2024. And when he leaves, no one is going to feel like defending that guy. And you want to take this moment right now to break all those years of tradition because you're going to stop Trump, who was shooting himself in the foot anyway with this DeSantis stuff. Like, come on, man, you know. Anyway, Trump be Trumpin', and it works for him, right? So that's what primaries are for. So... Rather than trusting the process and saying, you know, if you really think Trump is that crazy and that stupid and that corrupt, that he's either all those things or he's a criminal mastermind. <laughs> you know, people around him don't die. You notice that? People around the Clintons, they're always dying. You know, died suddenly is like that. Before died suddenly was a thing, they had Clintons. It was the FOB, Friends of Bill, you know. Um, now, now you just got... Uh, you know, died suddenly. And, yeah, weird. So anyway, um, that's a small taste of kind of what we're going to do on the show uh, for the next couple of weeks. We're going to have fun with it. Uh, we're we're going to talk about some things that are a little controversial, but, you know, the thing is we're not going to make them into uh, situations where we can't be friends, you know, where we can't talk to each other, listen to each other. But there are opinions, and there is right and there is wrong. And... You have to acknowledge those things. The, uh, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to bring you some stories that you wouldn't expect. Um, I am not going to do an outrage train show where every show is me trying to get you riled up and then have, and it happens every week, some poor guy calls into the show, a poor lady calls into the show, I hear you, I'm so upset about what's happening in the country right now, what can we do to stop it? And they never have an answer. Notice that? Never have an answer. Because that's not what they're there to do. They're there to keep you listening by riling you up. And then you get addicted to that outrage. And you're like, oh, I'm going to be riled up even more. And see, the thing is, somebody elected that DA in New York. Somebody voted for that guy. Somebody who probably didn't originally live in New York. Maybe they moved from Omaha. Maybe your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter voted for that DA. Maybe they think Trump is terrible. Maybe they think that conservatives are all evil people that want to prevent women from, you know, a, from getting their access to health care that they need. People believe those things. So the question becomes, and this is what Rush Limbaugh was so good at, how do you put a show together that is informative, that is entertaining to listen to, that is just outrageous enough to keep people listening and to keep the media talking about him and bringing more listeners in, while at the same time giving people a sense of hope rather than a sense of doom and dread. 
Because Doom and Dread is easy to do for two weeks. I could I could do a Doom porn show for two weeks, and, and you'd just be crying. It would be awful, right? doesn't mean we don't talk about these terribly horrible things that are happening. When you have legitimate, recognized economists saying that the dollar is going to crash in this year, there's always a crackpot that says the dollar is about to crash. That happens every... This one secret video that you have to watch that the oil companies don't want you to see. There's always... Always something like that. But how often is it somebody like that you can turn on flipping Stuart Varney on Fox Business and see this guy on TV saying it? When that starts happening, what in the world is going on? So, number one, we are living through history right now. Right now. There's someone who's going to do 50 years from now, this day in history, and it's going to be something that happens tomorrow or the next day. So we are living through history right now. And I am incredibly excited to be the one to help you talk about it. Even though 50 years from now, no one's going to remember the Shrock show that was on for two weeks. <laughs> you probably won't even remember it. Heck, I'll probably be dead 50 years from now. But nevertheless, what if what we talk about on that show is heard by one person? And something that's said on that show makes something just click. Just one little pebble that later on can become an avalanche as this person learns more, does more, and maybe that person someday doesn't vote for that DA. <clears throat> That's what we're going to try to do on the show. We're, we're just going to, we're going to try to influence people. We're going to try to be influencers. It's going to be so cool. Yeah. All right. Speaking of influencing, let me, uh, let me take a look at your comments here so make sure that because I'm going to have to wrap it up here shortly. I've already been 20 minutes, and this is just the monologue, right? So there's no doubt I'll be able to fill the four hours. I think, you know, I was a little worried about that, and then I just do an aftershock for two hours and think, oh, crap. <laughs> I think we'll be fine. All right, Mitch is here. Steve is here. Ronald, hello, Thor. Did you get a chance to watch the Tucker video? It was interesting how Tucker said it would help the feds to start crypto. Yes, Ronald, I did watch that, and uh, he's not wrong. Um, in fact, uh, did you see this week uh, the launch of FedNow? And a lot of people are like, oh, it's the first step to a central bank digital currency. Uh -huh. FedNow is not the first step toward a central bank digital currency. FedNow is the acknowledgement that the Fed can't transmit money to banks fast enough in the midst of a bank run. When you're losing $5 million a second, from SVB Bank, how much should the federal government put into the bank account? When you've got, um, oh, what's the other bank? First Republic. And the big banks, out of a really uncharacteristic, you know, sense of, I don't know, just benevolence, deposit 30 million, billion, whatever dollars, what does it matter? They deposited a pile of money of Blarney stone of money into that bank. Now, isn't that what SBF did? You know, Sam Bankman Freed? Isn't that what he did with FTX? He took his customers' money and then made incredibly risky bets with it? Isn't this these big banks taking their depositors' money and choosing to open a bank account? Like, they're, what's the rate they're getting? Is it a good savings account? I mean, and depositing that with this bank to capitalize them to make sure that they've got enough money so that the Fed doesn't have to bail them out. You know they burnt through that money by Friday? That bank could fail next week. That money's gone. It's been withdrawn. And there's more money to withdraw. And so there's, there is so much happening right now that the Fed can't transmit money fast enough. So they need a way to transmit money 24-7, 365. Because you can't have a bank close on a Friday and then people wondering all weekend if they're going to get their money out on Monday because what's the first thing they're going to do Monday morning? See, we don't live in an, in an economy anymore where you have to go line up outside the bank. This is not It's a Wonderful Life, okay? You know, kid, what, what do you need? What do you need? Well, 20 get you by. You know, that's not how life works now. Life works like me saying all weekend, oh, am I going to be able to get my money? And then at 8 a.m. on Monday... Boom. Ooh. Whew. I just transferred it all to a money market account. Oh, now 
not safe. That's how capital flight flees. That's why the Fed needs to put money in faster. It's not a central bank digital currency play. That's coming. Don't get me wrong. But that's not what this is, in my opinion. And I'm an economist, as you all know. Thank you, Winston. I appreciate the audio check. Good morning from South Dakota. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, Deborah. I hope uh, I, I'm going to email Scott because he's supposed to send me the, uh, the password, which is not the right way to do it. If he wants to give me the password for the KFAB Facebook page, you know. Uh, no, seriously, I appreciate his trust in me. Uh, he should make me an authorized user on the KFAB Facebook page, which he can then revoke later. Um, but that's the right way to do it. But potato, potato, if he wants to give me the password and that's the way he gets it done, good. Uh, so hopefully I'll be streaming the show for the next two weeks on Facebook.com slash, what was it, KFAB? Let me find out. Facebook.com slash KFAB. That would make sense to me, but that's not what it is. So let's see, maybe it's like 1110 KFAB. And then if I, if I don't find it at 1110 KFAB, I'm going to have to search for it. There we go, News Radio 1110 KFAB. Up it up it up it up it up it up it up. All right, yep. The content's being posted there right now. That's right. Sixteen thousand two hundred people follow this. All right. So uh, we're gonna try to post it at uh, Facebook.com/slash eleven ten kfab. So if you don't follow kfab now, if you click, if you go to Facebook.com/slash eleven ten kfab, I'll drop a link here for you. Um, you can go there and you can follow it. And you can always unfollow something later if you don't want to keep following it. If you're from South Dakota and you really care about all the daily news in Omaha, you can always unfollow it after my two weeks are up. But if you want to get a notification when we go live, that's how you'll get a notification when we go live. All right. Da, 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 da. Roger, we're back with you. Ronald, I hope people protest for Trump, but peacefully. That's the problem. How will you know? So let's say more than a handful of people get together someplace. Number one, where are you going to protest? In New York, outside of the district attorney's office, or wherever Trump is being arrested? Are you going to show up there to protest? Uh, number two, when you show up to protest, then it's going to be Trump being arrested as people protest, as people who are protesting are being you know, guarded with the counterterrorism task force from the FBI. And then, of course, Ray Epps will show up and, you know, Ray Epps will be like, yeehaw, throw something through the window, you know, and some kid will be like, yeah, let's throw it through the window, like SpongeBob, and then boom, all of a sudden you're a violent mob and it's an insurrection. And you know, There's a guy with horns, and I mean, I'm just saying, it's going to go sideways. I wouldn't go to that protest, I'm just saying. I wouldn't, I'll do my protesting on the microphone. Oh, uh, let's see, Richard's here, Mark is here, another Mark. Okay, good luck doing the afternoon show on KFAB. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. You know, um, I am a little bit afraid that, like, you know, some old lady's going to call and be like, you're a complete waste of oxygen. You are a disgrace to KFAB's airwaves, and you need to go crawl in a hole and die. I think they said that to Joe Herring at one point. I think it was my grandma, God rest her soul, who called in from the dead, from the grave, and yelled at Joe Herring. Um, and I thought... Sweet baby Jesus, do I want to do this? Like, um, I don't want to get yelled at. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, so you're not supposed to care what people think about you when you do the show, right? But I'm a local business owner also, so I have to care. I can't go on there and be like, all you liberals are knucking futs, and I don't want anything to do with you. Well, that's half my customers. Their money is green, too. Just because they don't listen to the show doesn't mean they don't come in and have me fix their computers. Ernie Chambers is one of my customers. His money is green like everybody else's, you know? So, and that's part of it too. You know, we let politics dictate, you know, where you can go and who you can do business with. Uh, the world would just not be a pleasant place. We got a small taste of that uh, during the Black Lives Matter debacle. Um, it's just, it's not a pleasant place for anybody to be. Oh, uh, let's see. I see your strength on KFB Afternoon Show will be your insight into things, your knowledge into things. Oh, thanks, Ronald. Yeah, that's, uh, I've been reading a lot because I'm like, I really need to be informed. Like, you know, I'm worried that someone's going to pop quiz me. Like, oh, what's Article 2, Section 3 of the United States Constitution, huh? And I'll be like, 
Ah, is that the more perfect union part? Although there's some really interesting stories I, I've come across, though, in researching stuff. Um, you hear about Mark Levin always talking about a, a Article 5, right? You know, we want to have a constitutional convention. Did you know that enough states already ratified for an Article 5 convention in the 70s? We already did it. But Congress did not act. The Constitution says Congress shall act. It doesn't say when Congress is supposed to act. So since the states did vote back in the day to do this, could Congress, could the House of Representatives today act on that? Because it says in the Constitution, you shall. And they certainly shall not already, so it's time to shall. Interesting. Uh, morning, Thor. I totally, <coughs> excuse me, I totally agree with you about Hannity and most others. You know, and it's not to say that there's not good contributions, right? Um, in the short term, pointing out absurdity. <sighs> All right, let me rewind this for a second. Persons are smart and people are stupid. So if you're talking to people, their short-term memory is going to be very short. They're going to be thinking about what's going on around them in that moment and not reflecting on where the decisions for today will take you forward. Uh, this is one of the, this is the big difference, right? And this is established throughout history. An emotional argument against a logical argument will always result in a logical argument losing because people are emotional creatures. So if you can make an emotional plea, that is going to resonate. And that's what Hannity is doing. He's making an emotional plea that is short-sighted, that is short-term, because emotion is short-term. You can feel something completely different tomorrow, and that's okay because it's an emotion. It's not based on fact. You can cherry-pick facts and figures to support your emotions. People do it all the time online. Did you know that 97.6% of all statistics are completely made up? It's true. It's completely true. <laughs> oh, let's see. Instead of showing up for a protest, everyone should post on social media if Trump's arrested, we will withdraw a large sum of money <laughs> we can from the major banks. <laughs> That'd be great. You know, this is one of the things. Is, is the projected, the leaked, that's what it was, a leak, right? The leaked arrest of President Trump, is that a distraction from the banking crisis that's happening, that's unfolding right in front of us right now, or is the banking crisis the distraction for the Trump arrest? You can make arguments on that one, right? Interesting stuff. All Clinton had to say is, this is a personal matter and I will not discuss it. Well, Trump says it never happened. He literally says, that never happened. I never had a relationship with her. Now, Stormy Daniels wrote a book talking about her view of things. Let's keep it family rated. Um, could have been completely made up. Trump could be telling the truth. It's not the first time someone has lied about something of deviance with Trump. Remember the, the fake pee tape that he liked to have people peeing on him? And there's a tape. And all the liberals are like, oh, there's a tape. No one ever saw the tape. The tape doesn't exist. If it does exist, no one's ever seen it. Um, and that's nasty. And we would all agree that that's nasty. Well, maybe not all of us, but the vast majority of us, myself included, would think, I don't want to be peed on. That's nasty. So could this whole thing be an elaborate fake news operation? You have to consider that, right? And, you know, normally, five years ago, ten years ago, you'd have been like, come on, Thor, what are the odds? You know, what are the odds? Come on, of course he did this. And of course he paid to have it not come out to light. You'd have done the same thing if you'd have done that. You'd have paid to make it go away, too, if you had that kind of money. So that's probably what he does all the time. He pays people to make things go away. And that's business. You know, okay. Um, that's not my business, but okay. I don't have that. I don't have Trump money either, I guess. Maybe you get bored after a while. I don't know. So 
he says it never happened. Maybe it never happened. Maybe he really did have a lady blackmailing him. And he really did call Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen's legal advice was, you know, you're running for president, and this could derail the whole thing. So my legal advice to you would be to form some kind of an agreement with this individual to get their silence. And, and part of that, we will have a, a non-disclosure agreement and everything else that goes along with it so that they can't take it back later. Oh, okay. All right. Is that something you can take care of for me? I would be happy to handle the legal matter. Yes. All right. What do I owe you? Oh, about $130,000. Oh, you're so good at what you do. Here you go. Did it happen like that? And then Cohen went and did his magical fixer stuff because that's what his value to Trump is. He was the fixer, right? He was the guy that made things go away, that made things happen, that got deals done. He was the cut, uh, what do they call that in, in uh, spycraft? Uh, the, the, not the cutaway. Oh, gosh, uh, the word's escaping me. Basically, somebody you can cut out. The cutout. <laughs> it's called the cutout. He's the cutout. So literally, if, if he gets skewered because something went sideways, he can get prosecuted and Trump doesn't go down. He's the cutout. Um, but here we are. So I guess it didn't work out. Uh, let's see. I also agree. Take out your money. Taking out your money is a start. This is a massive abuse of power for the district attorney to arrest Trump. And I think it's a crime. This, I think the crime is supposed to be a misdemeanor. Uh, the, yes, the crime that they're accusing him of, if they can prove that he did it, if there's enough evidence to prosecute, which a federal grand jury said there was not, by the way, if they can get enough evidence to prosecute it and they can convict him of that crime, then the secondary, that's a misdemeanor conviction, but now they're saying it's going to be a felony because it was done while committing a second crime, which was lying about uh, campaign donations to his campaign. The same thing that Hillary Clinton has done. The same thing that, I mean, every politician has amended their, I mean, it's the same thing Jeff Fortenberry did. Okay? So, Jeff Fortenberry is a felon. Interesting. Or is he? It, did they convict him of a felony? I don't. I don't know. You have to see. This is the. I got to be careful about this on KFAB, right? I just said Jeff Fortenberry is a felon. I don't know that he's a felon. I have to. I should check right now, just so I don't. Jeff Fortenberry felon, and we have to. Jeff Fortenberry guilty of three felonies. Republican Jeff Fortenberry in Nebraska was found guilty on Thursday of concealing information and making false statements to federal authorities in regard to an investigation. Uh, he was convicted of felonies, and he is actively appealing them. That's a close one. See, i got to be careful on KFAB. Uh, is it an abuse of power? Yeah. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity yet. I'm going to try to find time to do it today uh, to look into this district attorney to find out if it's one of the Soros DAs. Um, find out how he got elected, what his political inclinations are, things like that. But, yeah, of course, this is a gotcha. I mean, duh. I'm looking forward to Biden's arrest. He might die first. You know, I'll die before I'm arrested. <laughs> or maybe they'll find him unfit to stand trial. You know, the dementia. Who knows how things change over time. I was strongly against Trump running again until the left started all of this. Now I want him in there and firing everyone on the Pentagon above the rank of 06 and to kill the Department of Education and many other things. You know, when it comes right down to it, his appeal in the beginning was that he was a bomb thrower, thrower and everybody knew it. Everybody knew he was going to go in there and he would take a machete to things. Consequences be damned. We... You've been saying for years you're going to move the uh, embassy in Israel to Jerusalem? Huh. Done. Well, how, how was that hard? Why'd that take like 15 presidents? Done. You can't do that. 
just did it. Well, the people are going to protest. Let them. Uh, wow. You know, it's... <laughs> You wonder if, if Ron, De, Ron DeSantis, for all the, the capable good things that he is doing and saying, you have to ask yourself, is he willing to throw it all away to achieve an outcome? Or is he a politician just like all the other politicians? That's what we don't know. And I'm a DeSantis fan, don't get me wrong. But that's what we don't know. Trump is a known quantity. Love him, hate him, whatever, you know what you're getting. And you may not want that, and that's okay. Or you may say that's exactly the medicine that we need, and that's okay too. Does Trump have the political willpower to not skewer a Federal Reserve that has to raise interest rates to 12 or 15% as the economy implodes around him and the stock market crumbles? Does he not care because he's not going to run for office again? Very possible. So, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm waiting for Biden to be arrested after he leaves office, but that probably won't happen because he's so senile that he wouldn't be able to understand what's happening. You got it, Aaron. I do believe that he's done worse things than made up charges that the DA can, or any charges the DA can make up. Good morning from Northwest Missouri. Best day for a birthday celebration and the rest of the week ahead. Yep, my son's turning five uh, in a couple days. And so uh, we're, uh, he, he's really big on to, uh, uh, Mario has this little character called a Yoshi. Uh, it's like a little dragony looking thing with a tongue that shoots out and grabs things. Um, cute, cuddly thing, not like scary dragon, like cute, cuddly little dragon. And uh, anyway, if you, know, if you know Mario, you know what I'm talking about. And he is particular to, of course, Red Yoshi, which is really, really hard to find. So we're having a Red Yoshi birthday party. So it's a Mario party with Red Yoshi influences on all kinds of stuff. My wife has just gone to town on this one. Uh, the other thing that my son really loves, to my consternation, is Chevy trucks. He has a beautiful Ford Raptor Power Wheels. But for Christmas, he asked Santa for a Chevy truck. I want a Chevy truck. Okay. Apparently Chevy doesn't have very good deals with the Power Wheels powers that be cuz you can get all kinds of Ford vehicles, but you can't get a Chevy. You 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 can't. There find me a Chevy. We found one. And it was like for a little kid who had a remote you could take control of the car and drive him around and stuff, which has been kind of fun to play with when he doesn't know what's happening and the car starts moving on its own. It's like this is what it's like to be in a Tesla. <laughs> uh, except dad's not controlling the Tesla. Papa Elon's controlling the Tesla. But uh, anyway, the, uh, so he's very much into Chevy trucks. So my wife came up with the idea. The lovely Kimberly is, is an amazing party planner. And she came up with the idea to build him a car wash. So literally, we went out to Lowe's and we bought PVC pipes. And she had a plan she found on the Internet. And we built like a tunnel, like a PVC pipe tunnel. And then we hung, like, brushes, like little foam rollers and stuff from it and inside. So he can take his power wheels and drive it through the car wash. But you see, his Ford Raptor is the outdoor power wheels. That one goes out and around the block, and you can drive it to the gas station up the block. That's his favorite thing to do is we, we go on a walk, and we drive to the gas station, the come and go. It's like, I don't know, five, six, seven blocks away. And we buy a bottle of pop and some Lay's chips and a bottle of water. And then he wants me to go drive him all the way, walk him all the way back over to a particular bench in the neighborhood. And we sit on the bench, and he sits on the, the tailgate of his power wheels, and we eat Lay's chips and we drink. And then we go home. So, fun times, right? So, that's the outdoor, the, the Ford, the, the memories you make with a Ford, let me tell you. Now, inside the house, the Chevy truck, he's going to be driving that thing back and forth through the car wash all day long. Yeah, and it, it's going to be fun. It's going to be, he's going to have a good birthday party. All right, uh, bank funds transfer, it's really an insight. Oh, bank funds transfer, see, see, it is an insight like that that I really like to hear. Oh, yeah, you know, that's, that was the first thing that occurred to me is what does FedNow do? 
Uh, Fed now just allows the Fed to transmit money to the banks, whereas a central bank digital currency allows the Fed to transmit money directly to individual people, removing the need for a bank. Now, the argument is a bank collapse could be engineered to cause so many people to lose so much money that they clamor for a federal uh, stable coin because they're so done with the evil flipping banks that they just want to get rid of them entirely. And in the process, people don't stop to think that you're trying to get away from insolvent banks. But do you know there is one bank that is like $160 billion upside down on the balance sheet with trillions of dollars in liabilities and no one is reporting on it in the news? That bank is the Fed. So you have a bankrupt bank bailing out other bankrupt banks. And when the Fed printed the money just to rescue Silicon Valley Bank depositors, right? It wasn't a bailout. It was a rescue because rescues are noble and good. and Bailouts are evil and bad. So, But it was a rescue. And we rescued those depositors, all those companies and people who knew what the FDIC limit was, but chose to keep their capital there anyway. Some of them were required to do so by by the bank, because it was a loan from the bank, and they said, you're going to leave the proceeds in our bank. So they had to. But gee, your, your risk managers at your companies never said, that could be a problem. We should probably hedge against the possibility of the bank failing and us losing all of our money. No one ever thought about that, so nobody did. So Janet Yellen rescued everybody. And in rescuing, that money, guys, okay, we're going to recoup that money through fees to banks, but fees are like taxes. Corporations don't pay taxes. People pay taxes. I pay taxes. So people pay taxes. People pay fees. And where do, who do bank fees hit the most? Where do banks get the most fee money? From lower income account holders. People scraping the bottom, getting by paycheck to paycheck. Congratulations, you just bailed out a bunch of millionaires and billionaires. Isn't class warfare fun? I hate class warfare. So what should those guys have been bailed out? Hell no. There shouldn't have been a rescue. Consequences. Actions have consequences. That's how we got where we're at. That's the big, the big pile of crap that we're in. It's because nobody wants to see a down business cycle. The Fed will prevent them. Price stability, full employment. That means no recessions. That means no cleansing. That means this is the same thing in California. They have you know, brush fires. Oh, gosh, the fire season, the burning the power lines up. Why? How could this be happening? It's because you don't allow anyone to go in there and clear out all the dead crap that grew under the power lines. And therefore, there's a giant fire and it burns up the power lines. And maybe it doesn't happen this year or next year or the year after that. But eventually, if you leave a dry pile of brush long enough, a lightning bolt's going to hit it. Eventually. And when it does, poof, there you go. Well, when you put off the consequences of down business cycles long enough, eventually you can't anymore. So Money Printer went burr and they printed all this money to rescue these people and literally undid two full months of quantitative tightening. So I don't know how deep in the baseball I want to get on the radio show, the KFAB show, but where this is going is I think the Fed is going to is going to raise rates. I think they have to. They're going to raise rates to combat inflation while at the same time they're going to stop doing quantitative tightening, which is removing liquidity from the system. Because right now we have a liquidity problem and they're willing to trade long-term solvency to fix short-term liquidity. This is you going out and getting a payday loan and having to pay back 120% of that loan in two weeks. That's what's happening. That's a dead air alarm. Some station somewhere is off the air. Is it KFAB? Let me see. Uh, I turn off all the audio in here. Nope. It's not KFAB. So somebody's offline in here, but not, not KFAB. All right. Last call for questions, guys. We're going to have to wrap it up here. 2 to 4 p.m. is usually my downtime. No radio or no TV. This week I'll be listening to the phone. Well, Ronald, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it's 2 to 6, by the way. So um, 2 to 6. 
Uh, <laughs> You know, and you know the five to six p.m. hour is the drive time hour. That's the hour that most people are listening. So uh, we are going to be saving some of the best content for the final hour of the show. Um, not at all as a ploy to keep you listening for the entire show. No, no, no. We would never do that. That would be that would be nefarious. But what I will do here in parting is I'll give you. Uh, there may be certain hours you want to listen. Now I'm going to also preface this by saying. Um, the whole world can change in the next 24 hours. UBS may not bail out Credit Suisse, and we may have a European bank cascading bank failure crisis a la Bear Stearns, Lehman style, going through Europe by this time tomorrow. That obviously is going to take precedent over anything I planned on talking about. Uh, President Trump could get perp walked in the morning. That is going to take precedent over anything I'm going to talk about. Probably not tomorrow morning. Uh, the, I've read online that the that the president supposedly, and I haven't sourced this yet, thinks it could be happening on Tuesday. But um, as of right now, the plan for the show tomorrow, if you're going to miss an hour, the first hour is probably the one to miss. We're going to talk basically about the Trump stuff, like what we talked about here. And I'm going to explain the exact thing that I talked about here, like why, what kind of show I want to do and why I want to do it. Uh, 3 p.m. is going to be what I'm calling our economic hour, the money and power hour. Um, we're going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank, um, because you and I know why it failed, because we've talked about it here before, but a lot of people listening on the radio don't know why it failed, because economics are hard to understand, and I'm not an economist, so I have the ability of trying to explain a complex thing in simple language, but I think this is something that can be easily understood, what's happening behind the scenes right now. And when you understand from a macro perspective, what's happening behind the scenes, the micro stuff doesn't matter. Does UBS get bailed out, bail out Credit Suisse or not? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter. The cake is baked, guys. The trajectory's in. You just got to know where you're going. Now, it could take 50 years to get there, right? The Fed can stay solvent longer than you can because uh, they, you know, they can print. But there are consequences, and we're going to have to face some of those consequences. And if we try to kick those cans down the road further, the consequences are going to get worse and worse and worse until we literally can't kick the can anymore because the can is like a giant Volkswagen bus and you're just kicking the tire and it's not moving. That's where this is going. So that's the yeah, second hour. Uh, da -da 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 -da. And we got, some, uh, we got some cuts, actually, for that hour. So we're going to have some, uh, some actual audio of people, people saying things. It's going to be kind of funny. Um, <laughs> then we're going to take and connect the dots. We have a connecting the, connecting the dots segment, which is kind of what Ronald was talking about. We're going to connect everything that's happening with the banking crisis to those, those merchant codes for gun purchases. So, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an unexpected connection, but it's connected. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, then in the 4 o'clock segment, we're going to do our community, our focus on the community segments that we try to, and again, this is a loose idea of what I want to schedule for the show. Uh, we're going to talk about LB 764 in the uh, Nebraska State Legislature. Uh, it is a bill that will change the way that Nebraska votes for president. No more split electoral votes anymore. So no vote going to Biden, no vote going to Obama. The state votes goes to state votes. Uh, and that's where we're going to talk about uh, Article 5 and a couple other things. We're also uh, going to talk about the Electoral College. And we're going to have a fun segment that hour where we say, let's pretend the Electoral College doesn't exist. What would be different in American history right now? And when you hear the things that would be different right now, you can understand why the Electoral College is so important. Uh, then we go into the, uh, the topic of the day which is going to be our 5 o'clock hour. Um, we're going to talk about the American Community Survey. Now, this is, of course, assuming that there's no earth-shattering news that day. That will take precedence. But the plan is to talk about the ACS. What is the ACS, you ask? I'm glad you asked. The American Community Survey is a survey that's sent out to uh, 3.5 million Americans every year and asks you all kinds of questions, like how many people live in your house? What are their names? What are their nationalities? What are their weights? How tall are they? I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit there. But they do ask, what, what's your home energy cost? How much does your home insurance cost you? Um, how many sick days did you take last year for each person in your house? Um, do you have trouble going up the stairs? The federal government wants to know. 
Uh, what time do you leave for work in the morning? Just out of curiosity, you know. Um, how many languages do you speak, by the way, and what are they? And uh, if you could just provide me a list of all of your friends and their home addresses, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you. By the way, if you don't comply, we're going to find you into friggin' oblivion. This is a legally law-abiding or law legally binding survey that you are required to fill out under the penalty of up to fifty thousand dollars in fines if you don't. And if you don't fill it out, if you just toss it in the trash can, then they start calling. Then they actually send someone to your door, and that the people that come to your door, they're scary. They're like IRS scary. The American Community Survey. Bet you never heard of that one. Oh, uh, let's see here. And then we're gonna we're gonna discuss the ACS and everything about it. Take calls, do the thing. Then we have a segment that I'm gonna uh, I'm tentatively calling this day in history. I'm trying to come up with a better name for it, like the the public schools have failed us history lesson or something. You know, something fun, fun and joyful and bubbly. I don't know. Um, but we're gonna tell you what happened. Uh, tomorrow is an important day in history, actually. I'm not going to tell you because you, you have to listen to know what happened. But, uh, yeah, some big, big things happened March 20th, 1965. Pretty crazy. So uh, that's a taste of what you're going to get tomorrow on the program from 2 o'clock until 6 o'clock, 1110 KFAB. You can listen terrestrial. I'm hoping that we'll have it up on the Facebook page. Uh, we're going to try to get that uh, get that password from Scott so we can get access to it. I'm not going to stream it to uh, the Schrock page. It, it doesn't fit there. This is not Schrock Innovations content. This is for Schrock content. I do have a personal Facebook page. Um, what's going to happen is if I stream it there, which is what I would probably end up having to do if I can't get on the KFAB's thing, if I stream it there, everyone's going to want to be my friend on Facebook. Um, very, My Facebook account I keep pretty private. Um, you know, my friends are in there, my family is in there, my close friends, my family, uh, and I post like pictures of my kids and what's going on in my life, like with, with family stuff. And, you know, some of that stuff I'll share with you openly on the air. And, you know, some of it, you just, you don't, you know, you just don't because it's private stuff, you know, whatever. All right. So let me make sure I don't miss any comments here before we sign off. Da -da 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 -da. All the big banks are going to deposit or shore up the Republic Bank. They already did, Steve. They already put like 30-something million, billion dollars into it. I have to get the number. Uh, and they used it all up already. It's already been withdrawn. The depositors are still withdrawing money from that bank. How many times are the big banks going to keep shoring it up? Because if they keep depositing into that bank and then the bank fails, well, the big banks will get a bailout. They're, they'll get rescued. They're, as a depositor, they'll get rescued. But why are they doing this? Has anyone ever stopped to ask, why would J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank, why would they deposit ridiculous amounts of money into a bank they know is failing? Why? I haven't heard a single person ask that question. Benevolence? Benevolence? I'm sure there's a wink and a nod somewhere going on that they're going to be okay if something goes sideways. In the meantime, the Fed doesn't want to bail this bank out, so please, why don't you help us out a little bit, and maybe we'll help you out later. Because you're getting all these deposit inflows as we scare the crap out of everybody in a community bank to make them pull their money out and put it into a big bank that we know will get bailed out because we don't think you're going to bail out the little banks anymore. In fact, Janet Yellen came out and said that she's not going to bail out the little banks anymore. So, interesting stuff there. Uh, Antifa will probably pretend to be Trump followers and riot. Yeah, that, can't doubt it. If anyone calls up, <laughs> if anyone calls up and kvetches at you, I what is that word? Kvetches? Vetches? Is that like a, is that a typo? What? Is, okay, use an example from people in the South and say, "Bless your heart and thanks for calling." Yep, that's exactly what you got to do. You see, you got. If, if somebody calls in, you know, the thing is, when you call into a radio show, this is what uh, the people who called in against Joe, or that were opposed to Joe Herring when they called in, they're like, well, you're just going to pop me down anyway and talk over me, so I'm just going to hang up. Click. And he's like, you can't drop a bomb like that and just run away. Well, they did. And it was funny because 
there were three or four calls in a row that did that. And so, number one, who do you think controls who goes on the air in the first place? Do you think all these people lied and said, I'm going to tell you how much I love Joe Herring. And they got on the air and like, Joe Herring's a scoundrel, you know. So he knew they were going on the air. He knew what they were going to say when he put them on the air. He let them say their piece. Because that's the thing. If you avoid criticism all the time, you'll never grow. And sometimes critics are just bat-flipping you-know-what crazy. And sometimes they have a good point. I've taken feedback off my, uh, off my compute this show and off my Aftershock before. Um, I took lots of feedback off the, uh, the first guest segment I did, our first guest appearance I did on KFAB. Learned a lot from that. A lot of assumptions I had about the audience were not correct. Doesn't mean it was a bad show just meant it could have been a better show. So now you get the better show. All right. Years ago during the Tea Party rallies, Glenn Beck warned about federal liberal extremists being a part. Yeah, that's the thing. Glenn Beck was like, you got to give the guy credit. I mean, the guy was a decade ahead of, of all of this, uh, built up a giant media empire, and then lost it all because his timing was off. <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, that poor guy, right? I mean, he's not missing any meals, don't get me wrong, but, you know, that poor guy, you know, he built such an amazing thing and there was such a movement and then all of a sudden it just kind of fizzled. Um, because politically, it became... Th that. I never really... I always underestimated when everyone would come out and say the two parties are exactly the same. Because... You know, I know people in the Republican Party, people who lead the Republican Party. I've known people who went and casted electoral votes for Donald Trump from the Republican Party. And I know they are not Democrats. I know they have deeply held convictions that are different from the deeply held convictions that Democrats hold. I know the two sides are not the same, logically. But in reality, when it comes to actions, they do a lot of the same things because before they are Republicans or before they are Democrats, they are first politicians. And I'm not bad-mouthing politicians because we need politicians. We need people to run the government. That's what a politician is, okay? Trump is a politician now. He'll tell you he's not, but he is. So when you have a politician making a political decision and you have someone like Tucker Carlson come out with the videotapes and airing them like that, and you see the leadership of both parties coming down on him like a ton of bricks, it makes you realize that maybe those people saying the uniparty thing aren't that far off. Maybe we do need a bomb thrower, somebody that both sides disagree with, to come in and shake things up. Maybe. Uh, there has also been a call for a constitutional convention for the past several years. Well, yeah, Aaron, there's a call for it, but the problem is you have to get, uh, I forget what the rule is, but a certain number of states have to vote for it. The problem is it already happened. We already had the requisite number of states call for an Article 5. Congress just chose not to act on it, even though the Constitution says they shall act, which makes me wonder, could you act now? Oh, I wish you were the new permanent two to six host. Well, you haven't heard the show yet, okay? And that's just the first show. That's day one. I haven't planned day two yet, which I need to plan so that at the end of day one, I can tell you to tune in tomorrow to hear these things. Um, you guys, this is a, it's a temporary gig. No offers have been made. No conversations have happened of any consequence. I know that Scott is uh, for, very frustrated with the situation. Um, he would have chosen to have that slot filled immediately if he could have. Uh, he's being hamstrung by by corporate, by New York. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's not him. It's not even KFAB locally. It's not even iHeart locally. It's corporate is slowing it down. And so basically, uh, if he had the right guy in the right place right now, he could not hire them just can't. Um, so while I'm on the air, actually, I believe the job is 
at least this was as of a few weeks ago, that he said probably by the time you're on the air, we'll at least get the job posted somewhere. And it's going to have to be up for a couple weeks so we let people apply that are not already in the stable of people that we're considering, and then we'll make a decision. So, you know, of course, you know, yeah, the thought occurs to you, if I'm on for two weeks, you know, maybe I'm in that pool of people they're thinking about, right? So then you got to say, you know, shoot, I'm running uh, a business full-time, number one, um, Number two, you can't read the time and temperature on KFAB without ticking somebody off, which is not a great place to be if you own a business. Ticking people off is not usually good for business. Um, number three, if I make a mistake and post a picture or say the wrong thing or say Jeff Fortenberry is a felon and he's not, you know, like things like that. If that happens, there could be consequences that reach beyond me losing a job that I don't need. That's the other thing too, guys. I haven't worked for anybody in 24 years. Now I'm supposed to work for somebody and do what they want me to do? <laughs> Maybe they should just make me a contractor. <laughs> it's easier to get rid of contractors. Um, and then there's also the family aspect of it. Guys, this is two to six. I have a five-year-old at home. Uh, I got a 17-year-old at home and I have a special needs 10-year-old. My five-year-old's going to want to start doing scouts soon. If I, if I was on the air from two to six every day, I can't take him to scouts. Um, my son, my 17-year-old, does guitar lessons. If I'm on from two to six, I can't take him to guitar lessons. Um, Parent-teacher conferences always happen between two and six. Won't be able to go. Um, the lovely Kimberly is going to be asked to pick up some of the load if I took on a job like that. Because even with my best of intentions, stuff always blows up. Things, things happen. I've got a great team of people at TROC, and we are covered. Like the next two weeks, like flies on honey. In fact, for the last two weeks, I was present all morning, and then I made myself scarce at 1 o'clock. Because that's I'm simulating. That's the time I'm going to leave to go to the station to get all set up with the backgrounds and everything and the lights and all the stuff that nobody else does. Because, you know, I think we're actually, I think radio is actually competing against every media, not just other radio stations. So if you want to compete with TV stations, you have to have video. Uh, but anyway, um, if we do all these things, and if I were to take that on, the effect on my family would be incredibly significant. Um, not to mention the fact that if something goes sideways in my business, I could be put in the impossible decision of deciding to go pull a shift in a service center or show up for my radio show. My wife will point out, it has not been more than three months since you were running Omaha because you didn't have people. She's not wrong. So I'm not sure. Guys, I love doing this. I love doing radio. It is fun. I enjoy it. As you couldn't tell, this is our one hour short after shrug. I'm three hours of sleep on top of that. I love doing this. It's fun. Um, truth be told, for 24 years, I validated my own success. Success is whatever I said it was, and there it is. And there's benchmarks and outcomes and things, but when you have a radio show, my wife, why don't you just start a podcast? That's what you want to do. I could sort of podcast like everybody else has a podcast I can start a podcast I guess then I'm competing with every other podcast I'm competing with radio competing with all these things but when you have a radio show that's on terrestrial radio it lends you a credibility that you don't have as Thor Schrock starting a podcast which at least when I'm on KFAB you've got the FCC guidelines to rein me in be on a podcast you sure you want to go there my accents are terrible. Terrible. The lovely Kimberly has made me promise to not use accents. I don't know why. Oh, they're terrible. They're terrible. Oh, let's see. Uh, Daily Mail says it's a Soros-funded DA. All right, like I said, i got to look into it. You never know if a candidate will have the courage of their convictions once they get into office. But that's the thing, though. This is one of the reasons I don't think I can run for office. You have convictions. You have things that you know are true. 
but you have an, op an opposition who believes the opposite. So if you stick to your convictions, you will get nothing done. You will make no progress toward your convictions, not even incremental progress. Whereas Democrats will make incremental progress every day of the week toward their convictions. Republicans want, they want, number one, they want a savior. They want somebody who's going to come in and be like, boom. They want a Trump to come in and just blow up the Department of Education and get rid of it, not realizing that a president can't do that. Congress can do that. A Senate can do that. A president can sign the bill, but a president can't do that. But he's all going to do it. How the hell are you going to do that? Don't. So the trouble is, if you go in there with your convictions intact and keep them intact, you will get nothing done. Nothing. You won't even effectively stop the other side necessarily from accomplishing what they want to do. Because when you don't compromise, you don't get allies. And if you don't have allies, your agenda doesn't happen, and you don't have the ability to stop anybody else's agenda because you have no one to vote with you. So day one, you walk in the door, and the compromise train begins. And the longer you stay, the more you compromise. And it's a game of increments, right? It's like me eating Reese's peanut butter cups. If I'm going to eat one, I may as well eat the whole bag, right? But you don't set out to eat the whole bag. But that's where you end up. And it's not because necessarily all these people are bad people. Some of them, I'm sure, are narcissists. And some of them, I'm sure, are sociopaths. I'm sure. <laughs> but not all of them, you know. But if you don't compromise at some level, you're not going to get anything done. So then the question becomes, how far are you willing to compromise? Where is your red line? And then you'll find that red line changes over time as you compromise more. And then eventually, after years and years and years in the Senate or the House or whatever, you don't even remember where you started. You don't even remember who you were when you got there. So it's a sad thing. I really, we sh on one hand, I'm really opposed to term limits because we have term limits. They're called elections. On the other hand, do you really want an inexperienced politician walking into this buzzsaw every 16 years in the Senate or whatever, or uh, 18 years in the Senate, like three terms, let's say, and then some newbie walks in and then, you know, maybe a third of the newbies survive the first week in the buzzsaw as the, you know, the other senators who've been there for two terms already come up to them and they're like, this is how it works, son. And, you know, when you have people rotating in and out, you have the permanent bureaucracy that makes sure the Senate runs, right? So maybe the permanent bureaucracy is, let me tell you how this works, Senator. You know? <laughs> so realistically, the solution to all the problems in America are really easy. There is one solution that solves the entire problem. And that is a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Because the day you pass that, everything stops. Because there's no money. There's no possible way to pay for the bureaucracy. So you have to let the bureaucrats go. And when you let the bureaucrats go, oh no, the FDA won't be able to inspect all the meat anymore. Well, guess what? Companies who make people sick are going to go out of business. And there you go. Oh no, the EPA won't be able to monitor the, uh, the, the water they release from the pent-up mine in the Colorado River. Oh, shoot. Sad story. Um, or, oh, the Department of Education won't be able to distribute federal student loans. The government shouldn't be distributing federal student loans anyway. The government should be out of that business and letting banks make loans to people. And when the people come in and say, I want to get a degree in, you know, cultural arts studies of the Native American, they're going to be like, uh, no. Or I want to get, I want to have a degree in gender affirmation. We're not going to give you a loan for that. If you want to do that, go get a job and earn the money and save it yourself. But you have no income potential with that degree. Therefore, you won't be able to pay the loan back, i.e., you can't have it. Well, that's horrible for people who are getting an education in our world. Our world needs more friggin' plumbers. It doesn't need more lawyers. Our world needs more electricians. We don't need more politicians. Our, our world needs more people who can build things out of steel. 
who could make circuit boards, who could solder, who could do all these lost arts that apparently we can't do in America anymore. That's the people we need doing real things, not getting degrees to do things that aren't important, that won't be important in years, and have no impact on society other than to affirm the next people coming along that want to do the same thing. You cut the money off and the whole train crashes. And I don't choose that word lightly. You cut the money off, Social Security crashes. You cut the money off and Medicare crashes. You cut the money off and the Department of Defense budget crashes. You cut the money off and a, you're going to have to make some really, really, really tough choices, which is why they're never going to cut the money off. That, it's never going to happen. They're going to choose to inflate rather than cut. And they can do that for a long time, a very long time. But we'll talk about it next week. Uh, let's see here. France is just the start of what's... Yeah, that France stuff is an interesting thing to watch. All right. Deb's, I'm, Deb's so excited she can't wait. Oh, me, I, me too. It's like the nerves haven't hit yet. I was, I'm too tired for nerves right now. But uh, it'll be fun. Oh, Support the woke no matter the cost. Uh, I think you need a... Stupid things keep popping up. I think you need a quorum for for a constitutional convention. Um, I don't. I think you need a quorum to uh, to hold the convention. I don't think you need one to call for the convention. I think that that has already been met. I think the Speaker of the House could literally just do it right now, according to the way the law is written. Now, would they do it? Of course not, because that would blow up the whole thing, right? So, because the Constitutional Convention, a lot of people are scared about it. We can talk about that later. But you need two thirds of the states for calling one. But we already had that happen, is what I'm saying. Two thirds of the states have already voted to affirm calling for an Article Five Convention of the States. It happened in the 1970s. It already happened. Congress didn't call the conference. Therefore, can Congress still do it? Because the Constitution doesn't say when Congress shall call it. It just says that it shall. Uh, let's see. You need Kimberly sitting next to you to act as a filter. Yeah. You wouldn't hear half the good stuff then, Ronald. I mean, come on. She's a, she's a good filter. Um, I, I've considered taking my filters and, and giving them class failures. So, like, a class one filter failure, that's like a delay dump. Like, Thor dropped an F-bomb on the air. Class one failure. Can't have that. A class two failure is something that's going to be interpreted as something that's going to be negative, easily negative. And it's not enough to hit the dump button, but it's something that should typically be avoided. A class three filter would be like an accent or something. And a class four filter is, you know, a limerick or, you know, some kind of a innuendo kind of joke, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we have classes of filter failure. So if, if I have a class two or a class one filter failure... That's a problem. That's a problem. All right. Let's see here. All right. Got to wrap it up, guys. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you being here uh, with me for the Aftershock and sticking with us to the show. If you haven't come in for your maintenance checkups, uh, please make sure you get those computers in, guys. The, the stuff I'm literally, literally buying by the pallet right now. Um, if something goes down with, with China, if any disruption happens with China, if Trump gets elected, the cost of electronics and the availability of electronics is going to be a problem because you can't take Taiwan out. And China, you could maybe find a way to work around with India or the Philippines or something, but Taiwan, we cannot exist without the chips they make, which is why we're trying to get them to open plants domestically in America so that we can keep their production geographically diverse. So if somebody invades Taiwan, we still have a chip factory. So, yeah. Make sure you take care of your stuff. And we'll see you tomorrow from 2 to 6 on 1110 KFAB.